So I grew up in this neighborhood across the bridge and uh, my mom still lives there. She's lived in the same house for 32 years. And uh, I was looking for a space and it was real hard to find. And then when this Craigslist ad came up and said, East End Work Studios at Maine and Danforth. I thought that's got me written all over it. And uh, in the ad, it, it had a few places listed and then it said one that said back trailer. And I was pretty intrigued about that. Uh, I'm not sure why, I guess I thought with a studio, you're always thinking about sound, both ways, sound going out, sound coming in. And detached buildings are where it's at. So I thought, okay, I think I can do something with this. And I checked it out and the price was right. And uh, I signed a year long lease and then May 1st, 2013, got the keys. And uh, this is what it looked like. And the first couple months were just kind of rehearsing and trying it out and getting the vibe right. When we started, it used to be like, or it was a studio, but it had also been a wood shop and some other things. So there was just these glaring fluorescent lights that I got a few complaints about. And uh, I just had just a little gear that I could afford. Uh, my friend Jake Hogue brought his drum kit. Sam Cash brought a couple guitar amps. And we just, it was, from the very start, it was kind of this community effort of like, I've got a space. Uh, everybody needs space to hang and, and play, so. There we go. I didn't have too much money, but I found a, an old Tascam console on Craigslist for 150 bucks from a video editing company. They didn't want it anymore. Worked perfectly. So that was the mothership. And then I found a guy selling eight or 10 or something dynamic mics, these old Electro Voice broadcast microphones. And I had some cables and we just went for it. And recording a whole band myself was a bit of a departure. I had, since the age of 12, I guess, I'd always had a interface at home, a little two channel interface. So I'd spent years overdubbing one instrument at a time, just me editing, overdubbing, uh, and then going to studios, other studios for the the, what they call the bed tracks. And I just kind of got tired of that and I wanted to record a whole band. And so this place, that console, those microphones, and I was, I was there.
what I observed in sessions past, and because when I had this space I didn't exclusively work here, I was still out, I was touring and recording with lots of other people. And I found that some producers would, would kind of make the performer wait. Uh, like you'd have to get the right microphone set up and everything would have to be measured and proper and then, and then they'd do a take and then they'd do another take and there'd be a lot of knob twiddling. And, uh, and then I found by the time the sound was right, the performance was gone. So my kind of bedrock idea was to flip that relationship. And if they go out in the room and I ask for a sound check take, you gotta be rolling. Because if you miss that, then it's gone. And even if the sound isn't right, you know, lots of timeless recordings have all sorts of mistakes and technical difficulties and missing intros. And But the thing about those technical mistakes is when you release it, uh, there isn't a, a cheat sheet of where the mistakes are for the listener. There's no kind of... When you release something, you, it puts this kind of sheen over it, where it says, I approve everything that happens on this recording. And then a mistake suddenly takes on this mystical, unique quality where it's just part of the recording. But I found it you really have to train yourself to recognize that in the moment because a lot of these mistakes or let's just say quirks uh, is it is very easy and natural to cast it off in the moment to listen back to a take in the control room and then hear like a really bad bass note you know a semitone off or something that's obviously a mistake and kind of discount that take right away. And I find you kind of lose some, some gold in that process. So again, I tried to flip that on its head and declare no mistake to be a mistake.
is conflicting. Um, uh, Dawes Road here uh, is uh, has been bought by uh, a couple developers who may be the same one. Who knows? Uh, and uh, this studio and uh, a couple others on the street and lumberyard are all being raised to put up uh, eight condo towers and counting. I've been here for seven years to the day. That's exactly how long I had the space. And I think seven years is a pretty good length of time to, to do anything. Uh, there are a couple of structural issues that I'm also leaving behind uh, that like this place and these kind of spaces um, are kind of, I think they're kind of transient in nature. Um, and artists tend to find these little cracks to squirm into and, and work in for a little while. Part of it wasn't even about it being a recording studio. It was just having fun trying to, trying to put this space together and figure out the angles of how all the walls should go. And, you know, it really was just one big learning experiment. Ren and Canning came over right before the studio closed and, and we were chatting about this kind of stuff and, and he looked at me and said, you know, just, it's done, but you know, you were here for six and a half years uh, recording and that's how long it takes to get a master's degree. So it probably cost about the same too. So that's, that's how I'm thinking about it, you know? It's, it's done, but you don't go to a university forever either. Gotta get out and go places. And...